to uh, first steps to school so let the let the community know about our elementary school and our preschool if you'd like to spend about an hour on that saturday morning and we hand out invitations mm -hmm. to 50 60 houses or 70 or 80 or whatever um, let me know because we can certainly use your help and it's it's a fun time time very well spent wonderful you in All right, now if we can begin with prayer. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, today we thank you for the opportunity to uh, discuss the hope that you give us in Christ Jesus of uh, a, a new world prepared for us, uh, the, our eternal life and the new heavens and the new earth that we look forward to, and we have this wonderful joy. In all things, as we live it, our lives, keep our eyes focused on this wonderful prize you give us. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this was the 13th chapter, the final chapter uh, of Professor Jeske's book, Connecting Sinai to Calvary. And he has this major focus on a future life in a better world. There's a few things that this initially causes us to consider uh, with uh, what eternity in heaven will be. So first, this is, this is taught in the Old Testament. Uh, very clearly revealed in the New Testament is the resurrection and the germ of life and everything Jesus uh, said, but the, the concept of the resurrection and eternal life is very clearly taught in the Old Testament as well as Professor Jeske lays out here. It's uh, different perspectives, but it's the same faith. It's not a different faith taught in the Old Testament than the New Testament. We are, have clearly seen throughout this book, Connecting Sinai to Calvary. And with that discussion on the new heavens and the new earth and the resurrection, uh, our ultimate joy is looking forward to the resurrection. Now, heaven isn't going to be, uh, the eternity in heaven isn't going to be disembodied souls floating around in clouds singing all the time. Uh, the, the descriptions of eternal life is, well, after we die, our souls will, will go up to heaven, but then Jesus will raise our bodies and transform them from perishable to imperishable. And then we will live eternally in, in the new heavens and the new earth. Now, what exactly 
will that look like? The Bible doesn't tell us everything, but uh, we, we get that concept that it's not just disembodied souls who have our bodies again, floating around singing all the time, but that, that joy that we look forward to it. So we move forward now, as you've had a chance to read already, to the, our questions for this study is, why are people willing to pay high fees for doctor's services? Animal choice. <laughs> As I received my $250 bill for a nebulizer for my daughter, and I Googled you could buy the one of those for $30 on Amazon. But they're not willing, they don't have any options. <laughs> so some people are unwillingly paying this, and that's, that's very true. How, uh, there are the people who who seek to pay any amount of uh, money to to spare their lives and to continue it on. What what would be the ultimate thought driving many of those people? That they believe it will extend their life forever. They're free to throw pain. Yeah. They're afraid to die. Many, yeah, many people, they want to extend their lives because they're afraid to die. They, they don't have that understanding of something coming afterwards about eternity in heaven. So that leads people to want to do anything possible to just lengthen the time they have here on earth. And they just don't dwell on that. They're distracted from other things. Yeah. So if they have that, that just narrow focus that they all they want to do is spare their lives. In some ways, it's uh, you can say there's a legitimate way to look at it. Because my body is a gift from God, and it's important to take care of my body. And you're taking the expertise and the talent of someone who trained to take care of that body. So in some ways it makes sense to pay them a lot of money to take care of this body God has given me. But there is, there are those people who do not have the hope that we have that are driven to pay any amount of money just to have more time here on earth because they don't see that eternity. And that therefore changes everything that they do here on earth. It, it, it leads to that inward focused life because well what, what can I do to better myself? What can I do to save myself? Because I only have this much time. Whereas we can look at our our confidence in eternity transforms the way we look at everything. So, so I mentioned the hope of pain. And I think that's an important point for that question because if you're in pain yeah, you, you, may, you can think forward and say, hey, we're going to have life in eternity, but gee, I don't want to be full of pain now. I want to be, you know, <laughs> so you're willing to pay a doctor or pay for medicine to make life more comfortable. Yeah. And I'm stealing a quote from Pastor Buchholz right here, but uh, we don't want to be so heavenly minded that we're not, no earthly good. And so then it's, we do want to have that, tell it, that mindset of looking forward. But there is a, a proper perspective on taking care of this life. So to balance it when we approach this question, Pastor Osman? One person put it this way, I'm not afraid to die. I'm afraid of dying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not designed. Yeah. yeah, I remember uh, when the coronavirus pandemic first started and I was a vicar, I was talking to uh, uh, to my supervising pastor, and, and he had a conversation with an elderly member uh, who said, you know, if, if, if God chooses to take me now, that's fine. And then he, he's like, that's a wonderful mindset, but I don't want God to take you in a, in a very difficult, painful way right now. I don't want, so it, to remember, there is a legitimate thing to say, you know, if I can avoid some of this pain, that, that would be totally fine. And if you have a means and you're not motivated by selfishness, <clears throat> uh, that, that can certainly be a good approach. Uh, Jesse explains it very well. And he says, Christians need to have 
one foot on earth and one foot at a time, which is very difficult. Certainly. So uh, we, we're looking forward to heaven. The, in some ways, that song, that hymn, I'm but a stranger here, is wonderful. And it takes off of that imagery of we're foreigners uh, in a strange land from First Peter, that we look to our eternal residency in heaven. But we are still living here. So having that balance of and using this life that God has given us and uh, using that motivation of the hope that we have to move us forward. Why are professional entertainers and athletes valued so highly? Uh, I don't check the news all that often, but sometimes I've, real, I've noticed that the, the news feed is often, what are these celebrities doing? And then I, I always try to get rid of those articles on the news feed because, I, quite frankly, I don't, it doesn't matter to me what these random celebrities are doing. But that, that is big news, is who's dating who and what's going on in that person's life. So whom is it <laughs> important? It, yeah, so that, that it is a question of who is it important to? Those people that write the articles, apparently. Yeah, that, yeah. That, uh, who that rapper is currently dating, it needs to be not only an article written by a major news company, but also promoted on a news feast site. But uh, what would be some reasons, especially that we read in this book, that entertainers, um, professional athletes are so uh, highly valued? I think it's a distraction to a lot of people for the problems in their lives. Yeah, a distraction is escapism. It's if I can see the glamorous things that they're doing, then it doesn't. Then I can not focus on the important. <laughs> not focus on the fact that my time here is limited. So then I watch the Green Bay Packers play, and I'm overly invested in that. <laughs> I, I have to see what's going on for the Phoenix Sun. Uh, just that, that escapism, or, or movies that can do that as well. So there's, there's been, having a proper balance. So it's good to be a Packer fan. It's good to be a Suns fan. Uh, but the, there's a line that we draw. Where is there a healthy fan? Fandom, where is there a healthy, just leisure activity, and where is this just an escape to deal from dealing with the reality of what's going on? And that seems to be one of the big reasons. Uh, one one author put it that in our country, people are amusing themselves to death, so uh, they ignore what's truly important, use themselves, social media, TV, hours of watching something on Netflix or Hulu or Disney Plus, you take your streaming uh, site, and it uh, amuses them to death because it, uh, it ignores you who aren't helping yourself in positive ways, and you're also ignoring the, the death that is coming. Do you think this has a lot do with uh, what, say, the news programs put out. They put out pretty much, uh, you know, oh, so-and-so got hit by a car, or so-and-so got robbed. Where is the one that so-and-so helped so-and-so across the street? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, the bad news is what is promoted. Well, because so I think we're looking here. for good news, but we're looking sometimes in the wrong place. Certainly. Uh, that when you see the issues that are going on, uh, that can also cause people to want to shut out from, from engaging with what's going on. So if, if all I see is, on the news is well, I grew up around Milwaukee, and every single day, 
might not be completely accurate, but every single day, turn on Fox 6 and there was a murder. It seemed like someone was killed in Milwaukee every single day and throughout. Same. And so then, uh, that, would, that would lead people to not want to engage with reality, because that would cause, that would make you have to deal with the reality of death. So then, the escapism, watching tons of sports, or watching tons of TV shows, <laughs> rather than being confronted with, some people are dying, and there is eternity after uh, this, this life ends. So, on that idea, why is death such an unpopular topic of discussion? Because, it's just, because there's loss and sadness. And of course, we're coming. Our death doesn't follow the, the terrible grief that we lost. Certainly, it does. So, we have hope, we have joy, but that doesn't. That doesn't change the fact that God didn't create us to die. God created Adam and Eve to live forever. Death isn't natural in that way. Now, since then, everyone except Elijah and Enoch dies, but that's not how God originally created people. It's not natural. And there's all of that grief that we have to deal with. So that is one aspect that makes it such a difficult thing to talk about. That I think, uh, so you, you think of, uh, if I were to die, that, that would be very difficult on my, my wife and, and young children. Uh, if any of them would die, that would be very difficult on me. It's possible they could die. They, my wife dropped one of them off at school. She could die in a car accident on her way back. There's thousands and thousands of car accidents in Phoenix a month now, so that's very much a reality. But something we don't want to think about. It's, it's unpleasant. Pastor Rossman? We often talk about death with dignity. It's hard to be dignified when you're suffering. So, you know, it, I know what they mean, but it's hard to. We're suffering from a curse. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. And so death is part of the, what makes death so unpleasant is it's the curse. That's that's an ultimate preaching of the law. That's saying that shows us how serious sin is. So every time someone uh, dies, maybe not in a direct way, but that does preach to us the severity of our sin and that apart from Christ, people are not right with God. Fair? We also can't control it. I think we can by spending money on medicine or dying with dignity. But, you, but the inevitability of it is everybody's going to die. And as man, we control it. We can change it. Yeah, as much as they can push uh, having a metaverse or transhumanism where they want to upload someone's consciousness into a uh, into either a program or a robot that that's that's still not saving someone's life it's, it's, maybe I don't think anything like that will ever happen but even if you have someone's memories uploaded still not them Karen? even when you talk about death for some people it's just negative they have no hope of life you know and you can't Get into them in heaven, but it's the end of it. They just feel done. What happened to you? You really don't know. Yeah, and it's a it's a stark reality that our uh, world does, especially our society, does not deal with. Uh, so, the, the many times cremation happens because burials are very expensive now. So cremation. But you, or you have a closed casket. But so many people I don't deal with death in the same way that they used to. Uh, the, the parlors and houses used to hold the, the dead body. People would see it and they would deal with this death. And now in our culture, you, you can go to a lot of funerals and not even see a dead body. So then you're not confronted with that reality. And there's other negatives to it, doesn't 
have the same closure, but also an, an avoidance of you know, thinking about it. Yeah. We, we have dealt with so many situations in our life, such as birth, uh, graduation, wedding, children, etc. We have not yet dealt with death. Most of us in our life directly. So it, it's hard. Mm -hmm. That's probably the hardest thing to deal with, even though you know that uh, you will be going to heaven. And chances are you, you don't know anyone personally that can tell you what it was like to die. <laughs> <laughs> so. You yeah. can get into the whole discussion on your death. Yeah. 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 Chances are we don't know anyone but that yeah. has experienced the pains of dying. So it is unknown in many ways. We we know what comes after it, but that, that's part of the whole uh, what makes it so unpopular. And then another aspect of it is there's a lot of people that are not right with the holy and just God who. They don't want to consider death because there is the law written on their hearts. There is a conscience that accuses them that says, you are not right with a powerful God. And that natural knowledge of God doesn't proclaim to them who the Savior is. God's revealed word does. So they have, there's a lot of people that are con convicted whether or not they want to agree, they want to accept it and acknowledge that they're convicted. And but it says that that is that preaching of the law and you deserve punishment for what you've done. Moving on to the next question. Yes. What answer to death does God offer us? The eternal life. Yeah. Jesus, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Eternal yeah. life in, in Christ Jesus, uh, our Lord. Is it what, such a basic thing that uh, preschoolers know this answer, but what a wonderful truth it is that uh, people who uh, we face impending death and, and judgment put Jesus as our substitute, Jesus is our Savior, and we have that wonderful solution to know that we are right before God because of Jesus uh, and what he's done for us. How would you answer someone who questions whether there is really life after death? Christ promised I go to a place for you. I am going to go. So a proclamation of the word. Wonderful. Other thoughts? The only real evidence we have is God's word that we can rely on. And if you don't accept that as the truth, I mean, I don't know if there's any natural things happening. Yeah, you could be snarky and say, well, of course, the grace is in it. Yeah, so then if someone doesn't accept God's word is, is powerful and you point them to scripture, then that we know God's word is powerful, but they will reject it. So, and that what would be. An interesting thing to consider is how would we share or talk with someone who says that there is no life after death. We could get in some rational discussions with them. We could uh, talk to them about, well, what leads you to uh, reject something like this scientific method? Is it, uh, can you disprove this in any way? Well, if you can't disprove it, then you should in some way deal with it. Uh, so many people will anything in the Bible that they view as uh, not a, as miraculous or something that they can't test, they will automatically throw out and say, "Well, there's no way it can be true because I, um, I mean, because this isn't something I understand or I experience in my my daily life," which isn't really a great way to approach history in general. But also to say, "Well, if you." So you can't disprove it. In some way, you have to deal with it. Most people do have the law written on their hearts. And to 
to share the, the law with them. But it's some difficult conversations to have. Ultimately, understanding that the gospel is the only thing that can converts them. So, uh, after preaching the law, what you know, Jesus and what he's done. So, we continue on to the next section here is hope for an eternal future. So, can we name several ways God created the hope of a future life in his Old Testament people? Well, if you'd have been there to watch Enoch or Elijah, <laughs> yeah, go to heaven. You'd have to be convinced. <laughs> Certainly. So one one of the ways was by his actions and by taking those people up to heaven. That was a clear demonstration. There is life after this because Enoch and Elijah were taken up. They were taken up to heaven. Uh, what would be the other way that he had? Covered. A little more subtle than that, but he said the prophets. Yeah, yeah, through the word, through through well, what they said, the prophecies about the resurrection, uh, through the statements regarding uh, those who had died. That the um, uh, the the example of Jacob is just a really telling one that he uses. So uh, Jacob died, and it, he was uh, brought to be with his people, but. It was buried much later than that. So it's his people who are, who are in heaven welcoming him into Jesus as well. So the people of God. Why is it significant that God calls himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? To show how long over the generation he has watched over. Well, that's certainly one aspect of it. If if they were dead, he was their God. They don't need a God to show that they are they are living yet. It's yeah, not and here. And that's how Jesus points to it as well. But that all of their descendants were also included in the promise and the purpose of this second. And so it wasn't just for them. What and it included great thoughts. And then when the, when the Sadducees who denied the resurrection confronted Jesus, uh, he uses this and says. And he's the God of the living, not the dead. And, and proof of the resurrection. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, he's the God of the living, not the dead. He's their, their God. That means they're living. For that confidence of eternity. Pastor? Yes. Also, that he sent a consistent message. <clears throat> yeah. Tell, tell each of those generations the same story. Certainly. It, so it's not, it's not changing. It, we could talk about uh, the the religions where the message has changed over the years. So there's one that's pretty pop, prominent in this area of the country where there has been changing revelation. The, the truth of God's word does not change. It's not, well, that we're going to be more convenient for how things are in our culture now, so all of a sudden the message is going to change. It's remained consistent from, from Abraham, from Adam, for us. Sometimes an Old Testament person uh, who died is described as being gathered to his people. Another person is described as resting with his fathers. Mm -hmm. Do you recall what the difference was for this? What? Um, I took, help, took his believers and gathered them to be with her, with his people. And the unbelievers were just buried with, mm -hmm. in the cemetery with their fathers. Yes. Yeah, so Ahaz was the example of an unbeliever that he was, he was buried with his, his, his father. It's a, a burial that, that he, you know, that's where he joined them. But the believers were gathered to their people, welcomed to it in, into eternal dwellings where the fellow saints triumphant. What was God announcing to his Old Testament people by the way in which Enoch and Elijah left this world? Like you had said before, he was the God of action, when it actually happened, the God of God was speaking words to them. And they didn't see anything, they believed his word, but 
These were actions. And, there, and what did these actions proclaim? The power of God, the, that there's eternity, that there's, there's life uh, after death here. So Enoch, uh, he, he walked with God in a difficult time, and God brought him uh, up to heaven, and to this day, so that is a testament that there is life after death. So uh, flipping to Isaiah 26, 19, to answer someone who says, the Old Testament does not teach the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Isaiah 26, 19. Which says, But your dead ones will live, their dead bodies will rise. Wake up and sing for joy, you who dwell in the dust. Your dew will glisten like morning light, and the earth will give up the spirits of the dead. So, uh, pretty clear there. Your dead ones will rise. Uh, a, a, a proclamation of resurrection from the, from the dead. Okay. Sure, in a clearer way, there is a proclamation of eternity and resurrection in the New Testament, as in many ways that the New Testament uh, can operate uh, in proclaiming things very clearly to us because we have the fulfillment in Christ Jesus. Uh, and uh, But this also demonstrates that that's, they had that same faith, looking at it from uh, looking forward to Jesus but also looking forward to the resurrection of the dead on the last day. So, uh, we see that the Old Testament does give us information about heaven. So what information does it give us about heaven? In Job, he mentions how that after he dies, he will see God with his own eyes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that it, uh, that testimony of the physical resurrection uh, from the dead. With my own eyes, I will see God. I am not another. Oh, my heart yearns. So that proclamation of, of the resurrection. Um, I'm going to look for a verse here. Well, Isaiah 66, around there, or 65 it is, uh, has a very wonderful uh, proclamation of what the new heavens and the new earth will be like. Uh, it says, starting verse 17, watch this, I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will, be, will not be remembered, they will not come to mind. That rejoice and celebrate forever because of what I am creating. Watch this. I am about to create Jerusalem to be a source of gladness, and her people will be a source of joy. I also will be glad because of Jerusalem, and I will rejoice over my people. The sound of weeping will not be heard in her again, nor will the sound of crying. There will never again be an infant there who lives for only a few days. Or an elderly man who does not fill out all his days. For one who dies at a hundred will be considered a young man, and one who fails to attain the age of one hundred will be regarded as cursed. Um, and so there in Isaiah 65, <coughs> uh, some poetic language there used, uh, as other scripture reveals to us, there is not death in um, in in heaven, but what this proclaims to us is uh, that joy, that every tear wiped away, uh, there won't be a, a sadness like losing a young child again, there won't be the sadness of losing a person uh, before their time, that, that peace that we have in heaven, that new Jerusalem being a picture of, of 
of the Aramaic. Yeah, it's not in the Old Testament. Oh, uh, passage in First Corinthians that I, I really like. I know we, Paul was talking about wisdom at that point, but he says, "No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived of what God has prepared for those who love Him." I think that's a neat description. Of like I said, he was talking about wisdom. He's talking about knowledge. That's knowledge of heaven. So but he cites uh, Isaiah that too. I think that's a neat description. Yeah. It's it, it can be difficult to uh, talk about what what does the Bible say about heaven because the Bible doesn't reveal to us everything about heaven. There, there's a lot we don't know. Uh, will there be animals in heaven? That is always a fun discussion. Um, it's well, will there be my my child doesn't have Jake? Well, Jake didn't have a soul. So what does that mean? What if I'm, I'll be happier if, if Jake's in heaven? Well, I'm going to see Jesus face to face. I don't know if I'm going to care about that dog anymore. Um, and then if someone pushes me and says, well, that, that makes me really happy. I don't like, well, the Bible doesn't say um, the, the descriptions of the new heavens and the new earth might lead to think maybe there'd be some animals resurrected animals that we have here on earth? Probably not. But uh, I'm thinking more of a new life rather than floating around in clouds and singing all the time. So there can be a lot of speculation uh, that we can get into. And I was told all the time at the seminary, don't let people get you to speculate. So I should just stop right there. <laughs> What about the Old Testament? Uh, what does the Old Testament say about hell? And then react to Thomas Jefferson's statement, a God who would condemn people to hell would be a monster, not a God. <laughs> so, uh, the problem of, of People see punishment for sin as a problem because they want to reconcile God to what they think is worthy. It's a misunderstanding of sin and, and God's justice. At least he believes in hell. <laughs> it's halfway there. <laughs> statement like that, uh, accusing God of being wrong for being just, shows a misunderstanding of our sin and the severity of it, that every sin, no matter how small, uh, is, uh, is rebellion against the almighty, all-powerful God. Uh, I recall having a discussion with an individual, he, uh, a prospect that I had reached out to, and he had, the discussion had been, what about a five-year-old that dies in a car accident? How could God send that child to hell? Well, it's a misunderstanding of sin. Thinking that some sin not that big of a deal. In that discussion, better yet, how about the baby that was just born? That so you can see if I, I have a four and a half year old, I've seen children that age do some pretty naughty things. But how about the, the, the newborn? Every sin is a big deal. It's rebellion against a, a holy and just God. I mean, in order for God to be just, He has to punish sin. If God just lets people off, he's not just. I might be merciful, but not just. Pastor Rossman? It's also a reminder of all people's sin, whether it's a newborn or a preborn. It just, we all have this old head of Certainly. So, uh, that all people have, are born with original sin, and that uh, innate desire to sin, concupiscence, and uh, with the lack of righteousness, and then they start committing what the 
dogmatic term is actual sin. They start committing actual sin. Both of them are actually sin, but as a term, actual sin. So, so they start committing sins, and all people are sinful and sin condemned to hell. And the Old Testament speaks about it uh, uh, graphically as well. Right? The Bible <coughs> does not present a situation where people uh, are just disappear, right? The, the worm does not die. Uh, the, the fire does, is not extinguished. We, we see clear pictures of the torment and the horror that it is, that is um, a reason to proclaim the truth because we know God has a solution. What evidence do you see in the Old Testament that God's people believed his promise about another life in a better world? <laughs> Well, David certainly wrote a lot about it. Yeah, certainly. So, and did some other authors. But and in the Psalms, more so than anybody. Else, very right? clear, yeah, very clearly in the Psalms, we have that concept of eternity that live forever. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Uh, uh, Professor Jesse says it's not I may or I hope um, for, for a little while. It's I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The concept of eternity. Uh, what does it mean to you that God has set eternity in our hearts? That passage from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Read that surrounding section. Um, an encouragement I often give is to, to read passages of scripture in its context, so where it shows up, uh, so we cannot be accused of proof passaging. We're just throwing out passages. So what does the Bible teach? Here's a passage. Uh, we'll we'll read it in its context and then organically see that truth presented um, because people can pull Bible uh, out, out of context. So there, the very, there's been jokes and gruesome ways that people talk about it. It's like, well, the Bible says go and do, do likewise, and Judas went and hanged himself. So you could make people think some very horrible things if you pull Bible passages out of context and push them together. But to read, uh, Ecclesiastes 3 11. Uh, I'll read the surrounding verses. And, and does the worker gain from his hard work? I have seen the task which God has given the children of Adam to keep them busy. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Yes, he has also put eternity in their hearts. Yet it is not possible for man to understand the work that God has done for him beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to be happy and enjoy good things while they live. Also, when anyone eats, drinks, and experiences the good things that this hard work leads to, this is a gift, and this is God's gift. I know that everything God does will last forever. So th this concept of uh, living our lives now with an eye on eternity, that, that and when God has set eternity in our hearts, Professor Jesse uses that to talk about how uh, we have that longing uh, to go to that greater place, to that new world created for us, that, that longing looking forward to eternity. So agree or disagree, you'll never be completely happy on earth because you were not made for this earth. I think if you read the rest of that chapter of Ecclesiastes, <laughs> no, you're not ever going to be happy. And 
The end is not good. So there, there, in some ways, there can be that understanding that I'm going to face difficulties uh, and I'm going to face troubles here on earth, but I'm looking forward to eternity in heaven where true joy will be, where there will be no more tears, there will be no more sadness, there will be no more death. Uh, how, so every agree or disagree question uh, wants to have some some sort of way that someone can look at this and say, no, actually, uh, I'm going to uh, look at this in a, in a different light. So how might uh, you say, no, actually, I disagree with this statement. You can, you can be happy here on it. I think the word completely in this thing that says you will never be eternally or yeah, you know, forever happy on earth. You're gonna be very happy when you get married, you're gonna be very happy when you have a baby, you're gonna be very happy, but none of it lasts forever. So that word completely makes yeah. sense. Yeah, and it really is dependent on how you define completely happy in, in your mind. Uh, so if it's uh, not the same joy that you have in heaven that you look forward to and realize you have that longing. But we can also say there are times where you're very happy here on earth to see all the blessings that God is, has given us, that oh, God has given me children to love, uh, a wife to love, a congregation to serve, and I can be very content and happy with that. Uh, so uh, we we don't want to, at, at times we can be so focused on heaven that we don't, that we forget that God has us here for a reason to serve and to, to, to live and to proclaim this truth and to enjoy the gifts that he gives us. You have to also remember that happy is an attitude. It's not something to fix. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're created. Yeah, certainly. certainly. So we don't want to equate joy and happiness. Right. So joy is consistent. Happiness is a feeling. Uh, there can be all the reasons to be joyful that I might not always feel happy. <clears throat> we're made to walk with God. And so I don't think we're ever going to be, we can't be completely happy until that happens to him. Yeah, so, but. <clears throat> there's only something missing. Yeah, it talks about the hiddenness of God. Right now, we can't see him. So he's with us. <clears throat> Surely I am always at the very end of the age. Uh, the mystic union, the Holy Spirit uh, in, in us. We have that kind of wonderful connection to God. Uh, so we have that wonderful relationship, but right now we can't see him face to face. So that, that aspect is missing. Pastor Ross, I saw your hand up. Yeah, I'm going to go back a little bit. Uh, you can even see eternity in the heart of unbelief. I think they still have the concept there's something after it. Touched by an angel. Uh, highway to heaven. Ghosts. Those all have the concept of life after death. They don't know how to get there, yeah. but they, they all have that concept. So there's, there's a turn in, turn in their heart. Or you go to the China and in Japan, they offer sacrifices for their ancestors. It's still there. They got that concept. Yeah. They're, they're, because of these natural things that God has revealed to us and to all people, there are those. There's a reason why uh, every culture had a religion. There's, there's a reason people had, had that God-shaped hole in their heart, that, that longing for the eternity, not seeking it in the proper way, not seeing the truth of it, but that longing for it. And we see that very clearly uh, in, in society where, where people have that, that, that longing for, for more. The, the rationalist and the skeptic is going to say, oh no, those are just uh, uncivilized people that didn't know how to deal with the pain of death, so they made this up. And, it's, and they, they say, that's why this is so prevalent throughout all societies. Well, that's chronological snobbery, looking back and thinking that every generation before you was uncivilized and not as smart as we are now, uh, which is a huge problem in itself. But also, it's, no, no, that's just, that's a recognition and throughout cultures that God has that eternity in their, their hearts. It's that longing for, for something greater. 
Eternal life in and with Christ. Do you expect to live with Christ forever? Explain the reason for your answer. The wonderful thing about questions like this is they're so easy, no one wants to answer. Because he said so. Yeah. God said so in his word. He created faith in, in, in your heart. Um, to, to believe in Jesus as your Savior. So you, you have that wonderful uh, confidence. Uh, and something uh, I, I can take... I don't have to take the blame because this was the question packet that came with the book. So uh, you know, I'm really not going to pass this here about the questions. But usually if, it, if no one wants to answer a question, it means they weren't given the tools to answer it, so it's too obscure of a question and it's not connected enough uh, and doesn't make sense. Or it means it's so easy no one wants to say it because it's insulting everyone's intelligence. And I fear that's what that one was. It was insulting everyone. You know that answer. How do many people believe that a person makes it to heaven? What's on their list? What's on your list? That, that opinion of the law that says I need to do something to, to earn uh, God's favor. It's hard to believe that it's a treat, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. People want to. Yeah. It, it, it certainly doesn't fit with American pragmatism, where I pull myself <laughs> up by my own uh, bootstrings. Why it, it does? It seems so unnatural to say, "No, I do nothing at all." That, and that how much of it is all God's work? Well, in eternity, He, he chose you. Uh, he sent his son to fulfill and take everything and to live for you and to die the death you deserve. And then he sent you his word through which the Holy Spirit creates faith and sustains faith in your heart that a baptism is when he, he calls you his own and it's his work and the Lord's suffering. He continually gives you that forgiveness and strength and to say, he did all of it. Absolutely all of it. Seems okay. too good to be true. Mm -hmm. yes. Where's the reason to just think, well, we have to do it ourselves. Yeah. I should be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, doing uh, good things is certainly one, um, one part of the list. What are other aspects that people might have? Mm -hmm. Where did it go to? Yes, so that universalism, <laughs> which uh, that one, it, I think there would be a good thread to pull on because there's some people. Um, uh, now I'm going to forget forget his name, Jeffrey Epstein. I think everyone would say what he is horrible. He did horrible things. So when it's people like, oh, uh, all people are saved. You, that I feel like that's where you start pulling on the string. Well, so Jeffrey Epstein's going to heaven. Hitler's going to heaven. Yeah. Well, all of these terrible people. So I think that one, but that is certainly a way that a lot of people go. But then they, they need to deal with that. So you're going to say no one is guilty of such a bad sin. They don't deserve eternity in paradise. So, every, so that universalism, good works, how about comparing yourself? So that instead of saying, I need to do all of these good things, I just need to be better than that person, and, and, and then I, I'm fine. Get further up in the line. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm ahead of that person. Where do they put the... Yeah. Where's the line stop? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm not as bad as the week. And so how do people believe that a person makes it to heaven? And what's on our list? Well, the righteousness of Christ Jesus given to us. So uh, there is punishment for sin, and uh, God demands uh, perfection. Uh, so Jesus forgave <coughs> all of our sins, and Jesus gives us his righteousness. Uh, the, the wonderful truth that we get to point to. And, and which in many ways is a unique thing. 
Well, it's what the Bible says, but an, a good emphasis from the Lutheran Church is that uh, the righteousness of Christ given to us, that uh, Jesus in his perfect life isn't just an example for us. He is an example for us, but that's not just what he is. That righteous life was lived and given to us. Because God does demand perfection. If just your sins were forgiven, you still wouldn't have the righteousness God demands. You need Jesus' righteousness given to you. I need Jesus' righteousness given to me. And what a wonderful truth that it has been. Why can you be sure that you will live forever with God? I, I, you know the answer. Yeah. And so it's because of Jesus. When on Judgment Day God asks you, have you obeyed my law perfectly? Uh, what will your answer be? So, yeah, Jesus did for me. I, I didn't. I am a sinner. Uh, Jesus did for me. And, and then we, we have a high priest who can uh, relate to us, and he has been tempted in every way, yet did not sin. To think of every single situation where you have fallen and where I have fallen in sin, that Jesus faced that temptation that did not sin, that Jesus' righteousness, a, a wonderful comfort that we can have in, in every situation. And to, to show people not just Jesus died on the cross to forgive that sin, but Jesus lived perfectly in that situation for you. And his perfection is accredited, given to you. What connection does the Apostle Paul make between Christ's resurrection and ours? As he rose from the yeah. tomb of life. Paul says the, the first fruits uh, of the dead. So uh, Jesus uh, rose, that gives us assurance, that gives us confidence. We too will rise. That when, when, we, we, when we see that Jesus rose from the grave, we know it worked. And then we know we too will rise. What difference does it make to you today to hear God's promise your body will last forever. Knowing to have all that's come. So to, that gives us confidence in that forever. That's <laughs> something I was thinking about when I, when I was looking at this question is, so this same body is going to be in heaven. Uh, it, it that does demonstrate an importance of what we do here. Uh, so it, it's this isn't uh, the Gnosticism where our our life that everything on earth is always bad all the time. Everything is corrupted by sin, but um, that uh, we the our bodies will be in heaven. So thinking that this is a wonderful gift that God has given to me, and to think about. I want to take care of this body that God has given to me. That they, they, my soul isn't the only part of me that God cares about. Uh, kind of connected to that in Christology and the study of Jesus and who he is, that we don't want to equate and say the same, that Jesus, the uh, humiliation and the incarnation are the same thing. So Jesus took flesh. Uh, but we don't want to equate and say the incarnation and the humiliation are the same thing. Because Jesus still has his human body. He's still man. He's God and man in heaven now. He is glorified. His body is glorified now. Uh, but to, to not think that uh, the incarnation is equated with the humiliation, that uh, Jesus took flesh and then Jesus submitted himself to the law, but Jesus still is true God and true man. And, and then this concept that God will raise our, our bodies and bring them to heaven, does, and it, that does give uh, an importance to things here. Yeah. Doesn't God say that your body will be perfect, that it will be made perfect, so yeah. that if there are things wrong with your body for whatever reason, 
it will no longer be wrong. Yes, certainly. And everything will be perfect. Certainly. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't take it. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> but it's but I'm saying that, yeah. yeah. But I'm saying that, I guess if you didn't, your body is still going to be perfect. Yeah, you did. Yeah. And you're looking at, what's the next question, too? What difference does God's promise? Your pain will not last forever. I think for you right now. So the, these difficulties. So as much as someone can try to take good care of their body, they're, we're in a sinful world that's facing the curse of sin, that things will not always be perfect. Um, I'm thankful that I have contacts again, so you guys can't see how terrible my eyesight is. <laughs> I have magnifying glasses that used to sit on my face. Uh, but to think um, that that pain of not being able to read things right in front of my face will be gone. That, that, that's pretty awesome to think about. Well, as you pointed out too, that our bodies, they're not going to resemble our bodies here, but yet there will be some <laughs> resemblance. I mean, <laughs> like that one. Yeah, maybe he's referring to you that. You want to put a nice stuff for you. Yes, that will be Yeah, yeah. No, so, the, be, so the, the pain and the suffering will be gone. And we can get into we can get into a lot of speculation. And really, you stop right there. Yes. Give me a word that I'm gonna stop. And as I said, as I said before, uh, I want to avoid too much speculation. But so Jesus had his scars. Granted, right? Jesus' scars are different. Jesus' scars are the mark of our salvation. Um, but uh, will our perfected bodies? There will be no more pains. There will be no more tears. But does that mean? Is perfect in the sense that we think perfect. Does that mean I'm going to have a six pack abs and, and that I am going to be uh, an inch taller? Or, or will, we, will we still bear those marks of, of who we are and uh, it be perfect? And, 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 our, and we don't know, is ultimately the answer. Uh, and, and then one more thought, kind of moving with that, is. Uh, Sometimes people wonder if we'll remember that there was sin on earth in heaven that would make us sad. Uh, well, the picture is that the lamb, we're praising the lamb who was slain. But so the, the picture is that we are praising Jesus who saved us from the torments of hell by his death. So that gives a, a pretty good indication that there will be some sort of knowledge. It won't be knowledge that gives us sadness. Mm -hmm anymore to think of that the sins but some sort of knowledge that jesus had saved us from the sins and from the problems that, that this world had well we are over time here so we can end it there and I close with prayer dear lord as we live this life we look forward with joy because of the hope that you give us the hope of eternal life, of being with you, seeing Jesus face to face. What a wonderful joy that is. Now motivated by this hope, move us to uh, serve and love and live these lives on earth to share the joy with everyone else. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You made lots of coffee this morning, that's good. I made lots of coffee today. Now nobody will drink it, right? <laughs> Yeah, the when yeah, when Jesus returns and he raises the body and we live forever in that body. <laughs> I'm <laughs> <laughs>